Welcome, everyone. We're so thrilled uh, to see you here uh, for this, uh, what's promising to be a very exciting talk, Our DNA, What's Next and How Far Should We Go? Uh, my name is Bettina Hamlin. I'm the president and CEO of Ontario Genomics. And uh, Ontario Genomics, uh, we are in the business of bringing people um, and ideas together. Researchers, companies, partners, whoever is interested to come to the table to solve big challenges with genomics innovation and technology. And so we are so thrilled to have the eminent Dr. George Church with us. Um, it's a real privilege. And if you haven't appreciated it yet, please do appreciate. Uh, in our conversation uh, just uh, before we started, he told us that 95% of the time when he gets invited to give a talk, he says no. So we're in the 5% where he said yes. And not only, <laughs> thank you. And, uh, and uh, so we're doing this exciting talk with you today, um, and George is, is doing uh, another couple of events uh, with us over the next uh, two days. So we're really thrilled, and I'm so pleased uh, to uh, um, uh, also share with you our great partnership with the Royal Canadian Institute for Science, um, who has really helped organize the venue here, the Gairdner Foundation, and also Toronto Health uh, to bring this uh, public event to you today. So just briefly, what's genomics anyways? And I'm just curious, uh, by a quick show of hands, how many of you have you know, done 23andMe, uh, Ancestry.com, or any other uh, of these services? OK, a few. Awesome, awesome. So you are no novices to the field, uh, but just um, for 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 the rest, uh, you know, the DNA is this elegant, complex uh, molecule that really carries all the information that gives signals to our cells so that we can function properly, and. Um, uh, you know, I think a way to think about uh, the DNA is really a code. Think about uh, your computer. Uh, you look at your iPhone and you see a beautiful picture, but your computer only sees zeros and ones. The DNA is a little bit similar to that in that there is four letters, and that is the code that signals to your cells how to uh, work properly. Um, and by the way, did you know that uh, the DNA um, you know, is, is sort of, you know, spread around uh, across living organisms. And whether it's a mouse or a dog or a tree uh, or us as humans or the Pinot Noir that you might drink, uh, the genome is really quite similar and has the same number of genes. Um, so, uh, and, and also when you look around the room, we all look very difficult, d different. But 99.9% .9 of our DNA is actually the same. So it's really that 0.1% that's different between us. And so we are at a very exciting time in that we have so much more understanding about our DNA. Um, and uh, there is this convergence of technologies around it. We get much better and faster in analyzing the DNA. And we have some great minds here with us today uh, to share uh, where we came from and where we are going with this. And so we will have a keynote address by Dr. Church um, and then uh, a, a discussion with uh, Dr. Reit, uh, Reinhard Reitmeier and um, Steve Scherer from the University of Toronto. Um, and then there will be plenty of time for you um, to ask questions. So to kick it off, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Stephen Scherer. Um, and Dr. Scherer is, is, is likely not unknown to you. Um, he holds the GSK CIHR Chair in Genome Sciences at the Hospital for Sick Children and the University of Toronto. And uh, Steve and his team have made many seminal discoveries, but particularly regarding how the genes are organized on our genome. Um, it's called gene copy number variants, and um, he has looked at how these gene copy number variants are important for specific genes, for example, how they relate to the etiology of autism. And so autism has really become um, his area of, of expertise. Uh, Steve is highly published, he has re received numerous awards, and he runs the Center of Applied uh, Genomics at SickKids uh, right here down this, uh, the street. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Scherer. OK, 
Okay, thank you, Bettina. Um, it's really a great honor for me today uh, and for all of us to have George Church with us in Toronto, and I get to introduce him. So my introduction of George will only capture a snippet of his enormous productivity and bandwidth over the years. George currently leads synthetic biology at the Wyss Institute, where he oversees the directed evolution of molecules, polymers, and whole genomes to create new tools with applications in regenerative medicine and bioproduction of chemicals. George is also a professor of genetics at the Harvard Medical School. Professor Church is widely recognized for his innovative contributions to genome sciences and his many pioneering contributions to chemistry and biomedicine. In the early years of molecular biology, he helped to develop the first directed genome sequencing technologies with Walter Gilbert. He also helped to develop the first <clears throat> massively parallel next generation sequencing technologies, having his fingers or his ideas probably in every technology you use in a laboratory today. Uh, it extends into synthetic biology and also gene editing technology, which is now captivating uh, the imagination of scientists around the world. In fact, he's actually one of the very few people in the world who can deliver a talk on reading, writing, and editing genomes based solely on his own scientific contributions. That's quite a compliment, George. <laughs> uh, George has co-authored over 500 peer-reviewed articles cited uh, roughly 100,000 times, placing him in the top 400 most highly cited scientists in the history of the world. Not bad, he's the way to go. <clears throat> He has 143 patents uh, and has authored one book, uh, which surprised me when I was doing my research, called Regenesis. So uh, let's all rush out and, and buy that book, and I think he'll probably talk about some of the ideas today. Uh, of course, he's received numerous honors, including the 2011 Bauer Prize for Achievement in Science from the Franklin Institute, and he's elected recently to the National Academy of Sciences and Engineering. But perhaps his most important contribution to science are the hundreds of postdoctoral uh, fellows and students that have trained with him. These alumni have started their own laboratories uh, and with George, their own companies. And in fact, they, they represent the, many of the people who I would consider um, the leaders along with George Church himself who will define and lead science into the 21st century. So we're really quite lucky he's gonna share his ideas with us today. And I just uh, wanted to um, reminisce about one story he told me the very first time we met uh, and I went on his website and saw he has roughly 100 trainees in his laboratory at any given time. Uh, and he told me that he always tried to have at least one Canadian in the laboratory because they, they're really smart and they really worked hard. <laughs> so um, uh, I know Fritz Roth uh, is on faculty. I'm not sure if he's here today. And there's many others that I know who have graduated. I read their papers uh, very carefully. So George, we welcome you to Toronto uh, to take the stage and deliver your presentation on our DNA, what's next and how far we sh should we go. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, some of the other Canadians were Raj Jari and Francois Vignon. Vignon's, uh, uh, so this is uh, our DNA, what's next and how far should we go? This is my conflict of interest slide and <laughs> my first of many thank you slides. Uh, so we could say uh, that genetic medicine has, has been here for many decades. But from the show of hands, uh, very few of you are participating in this revolution. Very few of you have your whole genome. How many, we asked about 23 and me, that's not your genome sequence. How about your genome sequence? How many people here have their genome sequence? I see one, two, three. Okay, so that's pretty typical. Almost every audience I go to, no matter how well educated, no matter how wealthy they are, they have not had their genome sequence. That means that it's, there's something wrong, and I'd say it's his perception of the cost, the privacy, and the utility. And I'm going to address these all very quickly. The cost is now close to zero dollars uh, to you. Somebody has to pay for it, but it's like Google Maps and, uh, and searches and so forth. So we want to reduce not just the diagnostic, but thera ultimately therapeutic. We do the diagnostics really to get to therapeutics or preventative. And the problem is there's fixed costs of doing the research and development on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, that's per successful drug because quite a few of them fail, so it's billions of dollars per successful drug. But if you have a large enough market, then, then that uh, is reduced. But many genetic diseases, the market is hundreds to thousands of people worldwide. Um, so that's a problem. Um, and I'll, I'll address that. You can also reduce the failure rate. That's the promise of precision medicine. It is not quite, uh, quite there yet. Uh, we can have... Um, 
preventative medicine is, is really great, and that's why the zero dollar genome is, uh, is important, but it has to be combined with some kind of genetic counseling. A lot of that can be done by computers. I mean, uh, we became experts in computers uh, without having computer counselors. Um, maybe we can do the same thing with genetics, uh, a little more dangerous. And there are things like vaccines, gene drives, and germline, uh, which in principle are zero dollars because if you uh, eliminate uh, a virus via vaccine, it's, it's extinct, then it, then it doesn't cost anybody in the world any money ever thereafter. And that's, uh, that's a big deal because uh, the amount of money that we spend uh, on HIV drugs uh, is trillions of dollars, and the same thing could have applied to smallpox and polio. So part of the reason we're having this discussion, and I'm going to be quite brief because I won't really want to get to the discussion part of the discussion, but, but, I, but I, I, I try to, uh, my wife and I both try to encourage uh, all sorts of discussions with all sorts of people, um, is because we have these exponential technologies. These are even more exponential than computers, which are alarmingly exponential. So this is like super alarmingly exponential. And for example, here I'm just plotting the, the cost, but there's also quality and uh, improvements as well that are also quick. Uh, so around 1990 to 2004, we got this $3 billion genome for the 3 billion bases of your genome. So you know uh, that should be easy to remember, a dollar base. But it was a very bad genome, I should say. I, I'm, I'm, I, you know, I helped start the project in 84, but uh, I, it immediately mutated uh, in a bad direction. In the sense, it wasn't clinical. It was that they were averaging uh, your mother's and your father's genome, and so you got one genome when you really have six billion base pairs. So it was off by a very important factor there. So it was not clinically useful. The technology had to be completely redone as soon as the genome was over. And I would say that that's, but as it was redone, the, pr the price came down. It's called next generation sequencing. So by 2015, for the last four years, we've had a $1,000 genome, which is mostly based on fluorescent sequencing, just call it jargon, fluorescent sequencing. It, it, it also can be used in nanopores. So this is, you can have a sequencer at the end of your cell phone here. That's a smidge ion uh, for the nanopore. But, but the new thing that's just happened this year is now that we can get a zero dollar genome, and I say it's analogous to, uh, to, to things you come to expect like Wikipedia on the internet. Um, and the, but all, not only is it less expensive, but it's also uh, s deals with some of the privacy issues. And we do this, sorry, more jargon zone here, homomorphic encryption and blockchain. These are ways that you can ask questions about a completely encrypted genome so you don't actually you own your genome, nobody else owns it, you never give it away. They, in fact, they never, no one ever sees it in an unencrypted form, uh, but you can ask questions that give you better uh, health care or better research. So that's, uh, that's Nebula, zero dollars. And the reason this is all possible is not because we fill a room up with, with technicians or machines, because that just spends money faster. It's because every now and now with multiplexing, multi molecular multiplexing, every time you pipette, a drop of liquid now, instead of having one reaction in it, has billions of reactions simultaneously. And you don't have to micromanage, you don't have to have a billion robots in order to do a billion reactions. It just happens uh, on a molecular scale. That's called molecular multiplicity. And it's analogous to what uh, Edison did in 1874 with telegraphs, where he could send four messages simultaneously on one wire. So that's molecular multiplexing. I think that's the revolution, and we use it again and again. I'm going to cl claim that the future of medicine is prevention. I'm not, uh, but you can see just like the, not everybody here got their genome sequenced, not every funding agency spends a lot on prevention. This is the National Cancer Institute where that little sliver, that little 1%, that's how much they spend on prevention. Nevertheless, the, the, the power of prevention is incredible. Uh, almost everything we do uh, that's been of, of great uh, value, um, you know, eliminating environmental sources of carcinogens and, and uh, microbes and so forth that cause cancer. Now one of the things we can do about the environment, again, is this little nano, nanopore. So we've been working on this, uh, my lab's been working on this since the 1980s, and there's two different ways embodied in two different companies. One of them is Roche, and the other is Oxford Nanopore, and they have a lot of differences we don't need to go through, but the point is it is, it is going to be, it is already portable. It's the sort of thing where it's just minutes from, from your sample to the answer, which is a big difference from, from it used to be years. Um, but we, what, we, what we really want is something that's real time, always on, 
uh, constantly s surveying your, your, your mouth and your air for uh, possible things that you're allergic to or toxins and, and uh, <clears throat> pathogens. And we're not quite there yet, but we're getting very close. Uh, and, it, and it should be immediately hooked up to your Twitter feed to tell other people what's wrong with your environment, if any. Now, when we, do, when we apply human genetics to real human diseases, there's very different outcomes for different diseases. So I, I picked these two as kind of the extreme cases. Tay-Sachs and sickle cell both have long histories where we've known the molecular cause of these diseases. They both have the same kind of inheritance where two carriers here in purple uh, eventually give uh, a non-carrier who's normal in blue or, or, or a uh, doubly affected one uh, who, who really has the disease, either sickle cell or Tay-Sachs, can be a very severe disease. Uh, they're, they're slightly different on age of onset and severity, but the point is that the real difference is in one community they decided to, to, to uh, have um, matchmaking uh, where, where you avoid getting, uh, uh, getting introduced to or marrying uh, people who are, uh, are going to result in a very severe disease. And so the Tay-Sachs, part of it was because the uh, uh, Rabbi Eckstein had, I think, four out of his first five kids had this very serious disease that kills the kids in four years after a, a horrible uh, and short life. In contrast, and so that's almost eliminated in the, in the populations that practice this, uh, typically the Ashkenazi population. But sickle cell could have done, gone the same way, but instead uh, it, it, it is not uh, uh, typically genetic counseling. It is uh, monitored from among athletes, even young amateur athletes, but it is not used in any way for decision uh, making, for matchmaking. And it's the, the favorite uh, place for really high tech stuff, so we're developing gene therapies. So for all the CRISPR companies that, that, uh, that I know and love in Cambridge, Massachusetts are aiming, this is, a one, this is the one disease they have in common. But I think there's a misunderstanding about the value of, of human genetics, uh, and it's related to, the, to, uh, to our reluctance to use seatbelts. Uh, so it's not, a, it's not sufficient to bring the price down. It's not even sufficient to legislate that you need to get your genome sequenced, um, because here you, you had uh, seatbelts in every car. It was legislated. You had to use them. There were advertisements and, and jingles that you can't forget on the, on the uh, you know, buckle up for safety. You know, you can't forget. Nevertheless, people wouldn't buckle up. The thing that, that was the tipping point was this little invention right here where the, the buckle, when it goes in, it's, it, it completes a circuit which stops the annoying sound uh, in the car. We need something like an annoying sound because what, in both cases, your chances of getting something really life-altering, something that will affect your family, like a car accident or a genetic disease, it's only about 1%. And people can't wrap their head around that. They say, well, I, it's not, I'm in the 99%, obviously. I mean, nobody in my family ever had a genetic disease. I'm exempt, and that's just not true. No one in my family has ever had an accident in a car, so why should I buckle up? It's the same kind of argument, and it's a public health argument. It's a very difficult one. So if you do make it all the way, if you don't get the genetic counseling and you do uh, have uh, disease in your family, um, then, uh, then there, there are four fairly high-tech solutions, much more expensive solutions, I should stress. If you do, genetic counseling is less than $1,000, it may even be free at some point soon. But uh, the orphan drugs or uh, gen genetic therapy is a million dollars or more, uh, maybe up to $20 million over a lifetime. And you can fix it by adding genes that are missing, subtracting genes that are causing trouble, precise editing is kind of the holy grail, and regulation. And I'm just going to give a couple examples of regulation because they're kind of interesting eye candy uh, where we can regulate genes in order to make whole new organs. Here are, here are some uh, cells, stem cells from my body actually, almost all the human experiments we do on me rather than my students. Uh, <laughs> So that's, those are the lining of your blood vessels on the left and uh, neurons on the right, both coming from the same kind of cell, just under a different regulation. And this is work from um, Alex M mm and Peristu Kozlag, who have uh, now started a company to provide not just cells but organs uh, made from uh, 
these universal stem cells. And here's, here's a kind of a slower moving version of this where in red you see the capillaries that form. These are like, these are the normal capillaries, about five microns thick through which red, red and white blood cells will flow. Um, uh, and then the blue are the, the neuronal uh, nuclei. And uh, we have a betting pool in the laboratory uh, as to when there will be more of my neurons outside of my body than inside my body. Uh, and it's getting pretty close. And here's the example of, of the, the white matter in your brain is the, uh, and the, down your spinal column. You want to go long distances very quickly, so you wrap it with myelin that insulates it and makes the, the signals jump uh, from node to node. And uh, we've recapitulated this. This is the interaction of multiple cell types um, now happening outside of my body where that, sh that, that axon, little a, is wrapped many, many, many times by this insulating myelin. And that's what happens when you get multiple sclerosis or other demyelinating diseases. So we're using this to fight those, uh, understand and fight those diseases. And I should mention that, that, that almost, like I said, almost all the experiments are done with my cells, but I'm just part of a, uh, a bigger uh, project, which is worldwide, and, uh, and uh, one of the best examples of it is here in Canada, thanks to Steve Scherr and his colleagues. It's called the Personal Genome Project. Um, I argue it's the world's uh, only fully open access uh, source for human genome environment and trait data and cells, including stem cells. Uh, it's probably not quite the world's only, only but it is certainly the first and, uh, and the only one that, that that stands up and says that's what it's about. Uh, and it includes all kinds of data, um, like it, from the tiniest molecular data to the whole brain data. That, that's actually uh, my brain uh, slices. In 2009, there's been an up, update actually done here uh, in the city just a, a, a few months ago. Um, and those are, of course, virtual slices, not actual slices. Uh, <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, it's been used by the NIST and FDA with two uh, U.S. government agencies, uh, big ones, that, that looked around the world for suitable cohorts and they decided officially that there was only one in the world that, which had been properly consented for, uh, for the sort of thing they needed, which was to provide standards of genomics and, uh, and now cell data as well. So this is in U.S., Canada, U.K., Austria and we're now uh, growing some in China, Korea, India, and Taiwan. So here's the kind of the probably, when, when you heard the title of this talk, which I didn't choose, but I, I'm happy with, uh, about you know, how far should we go, probably the first thing that jumps in your mind is germline manipulation. And I'm gonna make the provocative statement that what if germline manipulation isn't the biggest thing, isn't the scariest thing, what if it isn't the most impactful thing, what if it's, um, adult uh, genetic enhancement or even adult um, gene therapy. And what if this is safe, effective, and inexpensive? Does that change the conversation at all? And the reason that, I'm not, I'm not advocating anything here, I'm just saying what if. Um, and, and the reason to consider this seriously is if you wanted to do germline, what this means is changing the, the, the genetics of uh, say an embryo or sperm or egg such that it will be passed on from generation to generation, um, as, I mean, it sounds like it might be both scary and cost-effective, uh, cost-effective in the sense that once it's working, you never have to do it again, and like I said, these are million-dollar cures, but scary in the sense that you are, you're changing generations without their permission. Of course, when we eliminated smallpox, we were changing generations without their permission. In fact, almost everything we do to our kids is without their permission. Usually, <laughs> they don't even like what we're doing to them, like educating them and <laughs> disciplining them and so forth. Um, and all of these things we do to them is, is surely as uh, faithfully inherited as, uh, as with sperm and egg. In fact, a little bit more so, you know, you, uh, you know the, the cell phone uh, is my daughter and my wife and I, we all have the same cell phone, but we don't really look alike. Uh, um, so anyway, but the other thing is if you, made, if you make a journal line alter, alteration, it's going to take 20 years to see that Turn, see how that turns out, or maybe more if you're trying to fight Alzheimer's or something, but let's say 20 years roughly. And then if you, if, if you need a little tweaking, it's another 20 years before you even consider it for, for public consumption. You know, uh, these are really long clinical trials. And then 
Finally, if it's ready for public consumption, if you're lucky you did it in just one iteration of debugging, um, then you're talking about 60 years out. But if you come up with something that works in, let's say, does uh, cognitive, uh, deals with cognitive decline of our aging population, does cognitive enhancement say to do that? That could be used off-label. It could be used, it could, it could uh, it's something you could de debug in weeks, cognitive enhancement, and it could spread uh, as fast as the latest uh, uh, software application, maybe a little slower. Um, so cognitive, en cognitive decline, cognitive enhancement to fight that is just a subset of uh, what you might consider an enhancement, uh, which is uh, extension of longevity, or what we prefer to think about in terms of FDA approval is um, aging reversal. If you say that I'm gonna extend your life by 30 years, then the FDA or the equivalent uh, agencies around the world will say, fine, come back with your 30-year clinical trial, which is prohibitive. But if you aging reversal, you can see effects sometimes in weeks in the animal models that we use. Um, and that's a different, that's an easier thing and uh, in a certain way is more interesting too. You don't particularly want to extend the, the worst part of your life. Um, you want to reverse to the best part uh, or at least the most useful uh, best part in a, in a health related sense. And so th there, there's a nice uh, review here, um, Hallmarks of Aging. Um, uh, which have uh, nine different uh, pathways. So these are whole. These are fairly well understood biochemical pathways. Some of you may have heard of these, like telomeres is a buzzword. It's often used for the ends of your chromosomes that are involved in aging. You can uh, you can get rid of senescent cells called senolytic uh, therapies. Caloric restriction is something you've probably heard of and don't particularly want to do. Uh, and the list goes on. There, uh, the blood rejuvenation. This is like the the the. the uh, you know, the idea of uh, transfusing from, uh, from uh, you know, young people to old. This has actually been done in, uh, very successfully in mice, um, and you'll see it uh, as a popular theme in Hollywood as well. Um, and the list goes on, mitochondrial function. Anyway, we, we, I think that there's a lot of wishful thinking in the field of aging uh, and aging reversal. You know, that what you eat or don't eat uh, is uh, sufficient. I think this, this is gonna be uh, very challenging, but not necessarily slow or, or ultimately difficult, but, uh, but it may ha require very uh, challenging uh, uh, gene therapy or, or other therapies uh, to hit all of these pathways at once and at a very deep and fundamental level. The advantage of gene therapy is you, you take the therapy once and you're done for, for, in principle for life. While many other therapies, you have to take the pill several times, depending on several times a day. For some of the early ones, uh, had would turn over in 15 minutes. Um, so, for gene therapies, uh, one of my ex postdocs, Peter de Magalis, started a, a database uh, when he was in my lab, and it's still going uh, many uh, over a decade later. Uh, on, and it in includes uh, hundreds of genes for different. Organisms. A lot of this was learned from worms and flies, but it is applicable to, to mouse and human. And we harvest these, and we looked for particular kinds of genes. We tested 45. It turns out it's actually it was much easier for us to do gene therapies than any other kind of therapy. We tested 45 of these, and eventually came down to a smaller subset, which we did in, in a combination uh, aging reversal gene therapy where we took five different diseases, and this list uh, it, it will, will grow very soon, but these are the number we've tested so far. And five out of five of these diseases are affected by this combination gene therapy, and these include high-fat uh, obesity, where we specifically put them on a high-fat diet that causes them to double their weight, and then we can reduce it back to their normal weight by this gene therapy. Type 2 diabetes, I mean, this is exactly what people want. They want to overeat and still be uh, uh, trim and, uh, Type 2 diabetes, osteoarthritis, a cardiac damage model where we do accelerated sort of aging uh, like uh, cardiac damage, and then kidney disease. So, this is work of Noah Davidson, uh, who has now relocated to San Diego and started a company called Rejuvenate Bio, which is aimed at dogs. So, not just dogs as a model organism, but as people care about their dogs and they will uh, buy. 
these gene therapies, but it also is an attempt for us to get an inexpensive gene therapy so people stop thinking of gene therapies as million dollar drugs. We hope this will be thousand dollar therapy because the, the FDA approval is faster and, and easier. This is just a list of enhancements that's on my website. Uh, we have these uh, universal CAR T cells. So this is, forget the jargon, CAR T is just a way of treating cancers. And this is, uh, 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 I'll, you can actually make them so that you can take them from any person and give them to any person. That's different from almost all transplants since the dawn of tran tra organ transplantation. Never before have you been able to alter the genetics of either the donor or the recipient. In this case, you can do the donor because it's just cells that you're transferring, these T cells. And, and with uh, gene editing, and, and uh, not just CRISPR, but all kinds of gene editing, uh, zinc fingers, talons, because with different technologies for five different genes here that make them more compatible both with the recipient and with possible chemotherapy you might be doing. So this gene editing where you're doing uh, knockouts, typically, of the genes uh, can have this powerful uh, possibility of making universal donors. You can make anybody who can donate to anybody now. We took that, you give us a cookie with well, more, you, uh, so we said, well, if we can do it from human to human, we can do it from animal to human. And this is an old idea, it's about 20 years old. Um, but there, there are more things that you have to make compatible to go from pigs to humans. They have the right size organs, the right physiology, but you have to fix the, their immune compatibility as, it, as we did in the last slide, but also there's clotting and coagulation, uh, clotting and complement. And most importantly, 20 years ago and $2 billion ago, uh, the FDA didn't like the idea that every organ of every pig in the whole world is um, spewing out retroviruses uh, all day and all night, and in an immune-suppressed uh, organ recipient, this is probably not a great thing. Uh, uh, it's, it's kind of a recipe for evolution of zoonotic disease, like you know, analogous to the zoonotic diseases of uh, swine flu, HIV, Ebola. Those are all famous zoonotic diseases where humans got too close to animals. This is very close uh, if you have an organ in you. Um, and so our, the first thing we did, so, so we were invited by the pioneers that had started this 20 years ago when we invented CRISPR. They said, hey, you guys might be interested in, we might need to knock out a lot of genes. We thought it was just going to be one gene, but it looks like it might be do many dozens. And so we counted the number of genes in our first pig strain that we did, and it was 62. And we said, wow, that's a lot. We had never done more than two at a time uh, with CRISPR, and CRISPR was only about a year old at this point as a technology, and we said, well, we'll try it, and, and it turned out to be ridiculously easy. We knocked out 62 in uh, about 14 days just sitting in the incubator. It wasn't even hands-on time. Um, and, then we, and then we did it again in a different strain, we made this cute little pig here, and a whole, now we have whole herds of pigs, both in the United States and China, um, and they're, going, they're now in preclinical primate trials uh, uh, at, at Massachusetts General Hospital and other Places. So that's, that's moving along very quickly. We hope to have uh, human clinical trials um, very, very, very soon. But keeping on that trend of we, we had two genes at a time, 62 genes at a time. I'm not going to show a slide, but we now have 15,000 genes at a time in uh, one cell. So we can really go uh, make a lot of changes. And I'm excited not about transplants, not just because we can solve the millions of people who need transplants, including many people who aren't even in, in line for them right now because they're so rare. Uh, we can now make it available to anybody. Um, but you can now actually enhance the organs. And it's, it would be hard to enhance organs in a healthy person to donate to somebody else. But if you're going to be transferring a pig anyway, you want that, those organs to be as good as they can be. You want them to be resistant to pathogens. You want to have the immune components we already talked about. What, we know how to make uh, animals resistant to cancer and senescence. We can extend the life of, of mice uh, by twofold. And we might even want to make them resistant to DNA damage and, and to freezing. And so here's three examples of organisms that are resistant to uh, freezing. This one is also quite resistant to radiation. Um, it's about uh, 100,000 times more resistant to radiation than 
than we are. Uh, and so we are inspired by these and synthetic biology is converting. Uh, we're trying to get these into humans and other and pig cells. Uh, we can also do gene drives where we engineer e ecosystems. The first thing we did was not to engineer ecosystems, but to draw attention to the problem. And almost everything I've talked about has an ethical component that, that my lab has weighed in on, typically before we do it, uh, or before anybody does it, uh, to talk about what the issues are. And clearly, we, we've got invasive species, we've got uh, malaria, Lyme disease, all of these could be addressed by if we can do a controlled release where we can contain the gene drive, um, but this needs to be done very cautiously. So I'm just going to end there. I want to get to the conversation. Um, uh, thank you very much. So you may have a seat yeah. in the middle. Yeah. Steve, if you'd like to take a seat on this side, that'd be great. Uh, so my name is Reinhard Reitman. I'm the chair of the Royal Canadian Institute for Science. How many RCIS members are here? Hands up. Oh, great. Thanks for coming out, as usual. Uh, if you're interested in what RCIS does, you can go to our website. We have a lot of uh, very exciting uh, panels and presentations coming up. RCIS is 170 years old this year. We're older than Canada. Our founder was Sir Sanford Fleming of Standard Time. Um, he uh, actually also was uh, the creator of the first Canadian stamp, which featured a uh, beaver. And uh, one of our panelists today was involved in sequencing the uh, beaver genome, Stephen, uh, sort of a Canadian Made in Canada project. Uh, I mean, he might want to talk about uh, why he did that as well uh, in terms of developing some technologies. So we're going to have a little chat. I'm going to kind of moderate a discussion uh, here, and then we're going to open it up to the floor for questions from the audience, because I'm sure you probably have many. So we'll start with that. George, that was a uh, wonderful presentation, very thoughtful and Thought provoking, I thought. Um, so uh, the title, maybe that you were given, was uh, "Our DNA: What's Next and How Far Should We Go?" Um, but before we go there, I want to go back to the future. So Fred Sanger, Paul Berg, and Wally Gilbert received Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1980 for developing DNA sequencing methods. And you did your PhD studies with uh, Wally Gilbert. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that time and maybe what your contribution was in that effort to develop methods for sequencing DNA in the 70s, I guess. Yeah. Well, even though I had been in Wally's lab for three years, I can't take any credit for that particular prize. Uh, but uh, it was an amazing time. There's no doubt it was a, a lot of team spirit. Uh, we kind of we, we knew we were, we were changing the way biology was going, not just molecular biology, biology in general. It's been, it's, DNA sequencing has been used for forensics, for uh, you know, history, for art, all sorts of things. So we knew that, I think, at some level. Um, and, uh, and, you know, and Wally was a very interdisciplinary person. That was part of the reason I was attracted to him, because ever since I was young, I did not want to specialize. <laughs> I felt that if I could do uh, everything at once, that would be really great. And Wally has always uh, uh, done, done that himself. I'm not quite, uh, it range, easy, even including things, not just entrepreneurship and all the sciences, but, but archaeology. And he's now an uh, uh, exhibiting uh, photographer. So yeah. I could see that, that from a, as a beacon from a distance. But it, but it really was uh, ground zero for molecular biology innovation. In, in the Harvard Bio Labs in general, not just in Wally's lab. That's great. Yeah, I think uh, Wally Gilbert started off as an undergrad in physics, actually, in Alaska. I remember him telling a story. He took one biology course because he kind of had to, and that kind of, oh, this is kind of cool, and the way you go from there. So that's going to say. So it that wasn't really until associate professor when Jim Watson recruited him from the theoretical physics department yep. to become a biophysicist, uh, which just meant that he was willing to work with. 100 millicuries of uh, P32 really? <laughs> uh, without <laughs> worrying about it the way most biologists would worry about it. That's right, that's great. So that, those kind of early days in sequencing, that sort of transformed, as you say, a lot of things. But how did that kind of work then inspire 
the Human Genome Project, and you again kind of on the leading edge of that kind of initiative too, and that, I know you talked about the limitations about uh, number of base pairs, et cetera, but so how did that kind of, what was the, what was the kind of conversation that happened at that time? This is something we could do when we talked about sort of value proposition, if you like, uh, the cost of it at the beginning. Yeah, so I think uh, there were, uh, so I, when I came to Wise Lab, I, I had ambitions to do what I call multiplexing and, uh, and sequencing everybody on the planet, which was not something we typically talked about, any of us did, but it, it was definitely, uh, uh, some, it was not just sequencing one genome, and I knew to do that, we had to bring the price down quite a bit, and that was the idea behind multiplexing. And I kind of messed up a few experiments during my <laughs> rotation because I was trying to multiplex way before I even learned how to do sequencing the ordinary way. Um, but uh, when, we, when we proposed it in, uh, in eight, 1984, uh, the Department of Energy had a meeting uh, to, to get a mutation rate, um, and we decided in the first five minutes we couldn't do what they wanted us to do. It was, it was like, you know, a dozen of us in the room. We said, well, but maybe we could sequence the human genome, and that's, and it just kept, kept going from there. But uh, unfortunately, there were kind of three camps, one which people who felt that sequencing human genome was a complete waste of money because 99% of it was junk and it was, et cetera, and it was going to cost a dollar a base. And there were some that, the, then the ones that won were the ones in the middle who said, oh, we're just going to do it with whatever avail whatever is available, very pragmatic, we're going to turn the crank. And then the third set was the rare set that I was in, which said, no, we have to reduce the, the cost uh, radically. And so most of the cost reducing was done in the shadows, you know, mm. like the mammals surrounded by dinosaurs. Uh, uh, <laughs> but anyway, eventually the, the last one also won. That's great. Yeah. yeah. So we already asked uh, kind of the audience about uh, who's had their DNA sequenced and what people think about 23andMe and maybe Ancestry.com. Um, maybe Steve, you can talk about your project. And when people say, I've had, oh, I've had my genome sequenced, maybe you can clarify for people in the audience what kind of the difference is between something like 23andMe, Ancestry.com, and the kind of PGP project that you're embarking on. Yeah. Right, so we um, designed our project in Canada based on what George started first in the United States. Uh, he didn't take Canadian citizens, or actually he had to be a U.S. citizen to be enrolled in their project. So we saw the power um, really to learn the lessons of how you apply genomics into populations, into the hospitals, into the, the general health care scheme. We needed to learn how to do consenting, how to do um, DNA preps, do the chemistry, the technology, and most importantly to translate that information back to the citizens in their jurisdiction. So here our genetic counselors do that in the hospitals. Right. So the, it was an experiment, it was a decade long experiment. We mimicked all the consents and things and worked with George's team. So we, we went very, very deep. We, we thought we would wanna do, you know, we'd like to do millions. We'd like to decode evolution by doing this to everybody. And we will get there someday, but we went deep on sequencing. Um, and, and there's a few people in the audience who were involved. But, uh, just very quickly, I think it's important, as George pointed out in his talk, when you generate a genome sequence now, the technology for your $1,000 genome is a bunch of short read segments of DNA that you then map against the reference genome, which is a, a collection of over 700 different pieces of DNA from different individuals spliced together. So ideally, the ideal experiment, and that's something that's coming, uh, is to do a de novo assembly of that genome and get the six billion nucleotides. So that complement a variation from your mom and your dad. Uh, and I think that will have a lot more impact. But in saying that, I think as George alluded to, um, already there's a ton of data there. He mentioned the 1% number where uh, I think for that 1% it will change your life, It'll, it could save your life. Um, but in our study, and we published it just over a year ago, and it was on the cover of the Globe and Mail, I think many of you will remember it, um, every person who participated when we did a full an annotation uh, got data back that um, could influence their health care decisions because we did a very thorough annotation. We included recessive disease carriers. We included pharmacogenetics. Um, we did save a few lives. It wasn't reported in the articles. Um, but, um, but for most people, you know, we're ascertaining they're, they're healthy, uh, so we didn't expect to find anything devastating. What, what's really coming now, though, is as we increase the numbers through worldwide projects, we're getting much better at interpreting what that data means. Uh, and um, 
So I think many of us believe that um, the genome is going to be like a global positioning type system where once we get more and more data and maps to compare against, it'll start to make more and more sense. And I'll, I'll just throw one slang term to keep your eye on. Uh, uh, it's everywhere in, in genetics in the last 12 months, but you'll start reading about this thing called polygenic risk scores or genetic risk scores. Um, there are some massive projects in the United Kingdom and now in the U.S. where they're using biobanks of millions of people to develop that fundamental underlying GPS system for genetics. Wow. And then we can take uh, actually smaller sample sets from specific disease cohorts uh, and then compare the coordinates you have in your cohort versus populations and, and make correlations and come up with statistics of likelihood you'll develop certain diseases or traits or things you might want to try to modify at some point. Or, uh, and the data is getting surprisingly good uh, and fast. Uh, and I think it's because there's been an inflection point where we've reached millions of samples now, whereas in the past it was you know, dozens or hundreds or thousands, and it just wasn't enough data. Great. Um, so this might come up uh, in terms of uh, you know, privacy issues, you know, um, corporate versus public interest. Um, maybe I'll just pose a question. Um, should human genes be patented? Steve, we'll start with you and then over. That was a uh, discussion a few years ago, you know, where we're at now. I got an email yesterday that our latest patent application was, was approved, so that was a, I was happy to get that email. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, it, 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 on genes, it occurs less and less. You really have to have a, a unique scenario, but um, I mean, there are obvious reasons to, to promote patenting of genes to uh, right. protect the intellectual property so you can do you know, specific research on that, on the utility of, of the application and things. And, yeah. Um, but, but, you know, patenting also is a way to get the data out to the community, too. That's, you know, we, we use the patent databases in the same way. Um, mm -hmm. We use the public literature, so. Yeah. But, I mean, he, he's an expert. He's got George, more patents. Yeah, let yeah. me just throw one thing, though. I think the, the point is that uh, for the young, younger scientists in the community is the technologies, in a large part, what George and, and his group have developed, really, um, you know, the you're only limited by the creativity of the experiments you want to do now. It's the ideas. You can pretty much do anything. Yeah. Like I said, you can sequence, you can, you can edit, you can, you, know, you can do anything, yeah. and it's pretty darn easy. Yeah. Right? It's not perfect. Yeah. It's pretty darn easy. Do I go away on that, yeah. sir? Yes, yeah, so I think patenting and privacy are two different topics. I mean, in principle, I can patent things from my own body without invading anybody's privacy. Yeah. Uh, I think what's misunderstanding about patenting is the alternative to patenting is not everything's free. It's the, it's the opposite. Everything is trade secret. Mm -hmm. And when you have trade secrets in biology, it's particularly harmful because that means that it's unlike uh, you know, something of trade secret I can practice in my, in my uh, factory. Uh, the biology is out in the world. And so in order to keep it a trade secret, you have to obfuscate it, meaning you have to put, you have to put all kinds of stuff that makes it hard to understand what's going on there. That's not what you want for, for human genetics or agriculture or anything else. So I think that's, we want, the patents are a way of breaking out of trade secret. In terms of privacy, uh, that, that uh, I think it's one of the main reasons people don't get their genome sequence now that it's so close to zero dollars. Um, it's both understanding and misunderstanding, but mostly understanding that, that you could, uh, even, even in countries like the United States where there is a law protecting you from genetic discrimination by employers and, and insurance companies, there's still all kinds of ways you could get discriminated against or could be used against you in some way or another. And that's why I think it's a, it's, it, it is a potential breakthrough to have a homomorphic encryption with blockchain, forget the mouthful, the way that you can ask questions that are of, of value to health, to your own health, without anyone ever seeing your genome, um, without ever anyone possessing it other than you. Um, that said, we're, so that's, if you voluntarily go out and get your genome sequence, nobody can pry it loose from you, um, but they can just go and collect your DNA off this chair, um, so be, be wary of that particular loophole. <laughs> Steve, welcome. Not about yeah. the chair so much. <laughs> um, so it, it's worth just uh, em emphasizing that in Canada we do have a genetic non-discrimination act. The last two one was passed about two years ago now. That protects pretty much against everything. Right. 
Right. Um, but but there were a lot of people um, before that time who were dropping out, either dropping out of research or not enrolling in research, also not taking genetic tests that could be life-saving for their children, we, we saw it, because of fear of genetic discrimination. So that legislation was hugely important. Um, and I, I just comes back to what I said earlier, every society deals with the information, and it deals with general information in a way, and genetic information is, I think, the ultimate form of information because it gives you a vantage point into your present, but also your past and your future and, and that of your relatives too. So you have to protect it. You have to be very careful how you use it. Um, and you have to think about others when you're making decisions. And that's what perhaps makes it a little bit more unique. Yeah, that's great. So you alluded to this, you know, so DNA sequencing obviously involves massive amounts of data. I know that's one of the challenges early on with the Human Genome Project. So maybe, George, how important was the you know, kind of things that you were involved with, software development, and nowadays the buzzword is AI, artificial intelligence. What kind of impact does you know, those kind of technologies have on what the kind of work and things you can do and where you might be going? Well, certainly computing is very big for things that Steve and I do. Uh, uh, you know, AI, machine learning, these are buzzwords that, that are just a piece of the computing uh, infrastructure that needs to be built up. There are certain things that we're using machine learning for that in, in biotechnology that are quite valuable, I think, already more valuable than they are in human genetics. So, for example, we use machine learning for des designing new uh, generations of uh, viral vectors for gene therapies. Mm -hmm. We've now built over a million different uh, computer-designed viruses. These are, these are viral capses, not viruses that, that deliver genes. They don't, there's no living virus there. Um, so I think there will be a growing number, but so far, most of the human genetics can be practiced, a lot of it can be practiced uh, without AI or machine learning. Okay, great. So uh, one of my professors, Michael Smith, and when I was at UBC, we got a Nobel Prize in 1993 for development of site-directed mutagenesis, and I think that's a technique that's still widely used to understand the effects of mutations linked to disease and anxiety, proteins, and engineering, et cetera. So it was alluded to in your talk, there's a new method developed recently called CRISPR. So maybe briefly, what is CRISPR? And maybe, could you relate it to yogurt? <laughs> Either of you? Right. <laughs> or cheese making? <laughs> there's a link there as well. So, so yogurt has, uh, <laughs> and many dairy products, have a problem with phages uh, killing the bacteria that are good for the production of the, of the dairy product. And, uh, and, it, and one, of the way, one of the ways that the bacteria kill the virus is called restriction enzymes, which was a, 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 an important uh, breakthrough at the dawn of recombinant DNA. And then the other way they do it, this, which is kind of a pre-programmed resistance. Um, and then CRISPR is an adaptive uh, immunity where you learn the viruses you don't like and you store a memory of their yeah. sequences and you kill them. And that was, har it was harnessed in 2007 as specifically in the yogurt industry uh, without full understanding of how it worked. Uh, and it was a long step from the 2007 harnessing in its first practical application to what we, what we all really wanted was something that was applicable to, to human health care and, and agriculture in general, um, which happened in 2012, 2013, when it was turned into a technology. Um, and I would, I, and I think CRISPR, I, as much as I love it and as much as it loves me, uh, <laughs> CRISPR uh, is credited with too much. I think it's, 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 I think a lot of people miss the revolution in recombinant DNA and in other editing methods, mm -hmm. and even in, up now. <laughs> e e even in next-gen sequencing, these are all kind of rolled into one, and they're given the name CRISPR, uh, and I just feel that it's my duty to say, um, as much, you know, it's a great name, but uh, there's a lot more to the revolution than just that. It's good to have a historian. <laughs> um, so, um, I think maybe you look a little bit into the future now. I think you had a little glimpse of it in your presentation here. Certainly, the CRISPR is certainly a, a Nobel Prize discussion in the wind. Uh, Janet Rassand is here from the Gardner. They usually recognize they're sort of one step ahead of the Nobel Committee in recognizing the importance of CRISPR. So, other than George Church, <laughs> I'll put you on the list. Who else would you think, or would you rather not speculate? Steve? Well, I'd, 
Oh, Throw Steve. It out. <laughs> I'm, I'm not the expert in this area. <laughs> I'm too smart to go in, in this time. No, I'm just kidding. Probability. <laughs> I, 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 think it's, I think it's actually uh, prizes could be as damaging as they are helpful. Uh, yep. It's helpful to, to raise consciousness and the public gets excited about them. Uh, but you, we just saw that J.K. Hu, uh, who, yep, who, 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 who did CRISPR babies, which you're getting to, yep. um, just to get a little ahead, he was clearly excited about the Nobel Prize. And I think that that's uh, that's, that should be a warning to us that if you, if you make a prize too, too important. Uh, also, there's always somebody that's left out. This, this rule of three yeah. uh, means that there's always a fourth one and a fifth one. And I think that that's, uh, that's counterproductive. Uh, it creates a, po a politics that we don't, we don't really We're need. Healthy. So, uh, you know, I think it's a team. The most important thing is a team effort and the teams are getting bigger and bigger. And I'm proud to be parts of, of big teams, and I don't particularly want to be singled out. I'm happy to, to you know, schlep my body around to give talks like you know, <laughs> discussions like this. I'm willing to take that hit for the team, but I, I don't <laughs> particularly want to. Uh, I don't think we need to Steve? be. Uh, yeah, I, grants are good. Yeah, give us some grants. <laughs> yeah, but not but not prizes. Yeah, yeah, my, yeah. Uh, I, maybe I just I was going to ask you earlier. Uh, um, <laughs> But uh, as you showed, you know, the, it, these technologies were incremental, were incremental and some were massive leaps in technology. Mm -hmm. um, but you were, you were there for the, the, you know, the Maxim Gilbert sequencing. I know there's a few people in the room who would have done that versus the, the uh, Sanger dideoxy sequencing. And eventually one won over, one out over the other, but mm -hmm. at, at a time, they, actually you'd use them for different applications really in sequencing based on their strengths and weaknesses. That's how I, I the first, first molecular biology I, I learned. And I, I said this before when I introduced him. I was the guy in, on the floor who had to make all the Church Gilbert hybridization solutions. So that's how I knew George Church when I first started. <laughs> that was him. Uh, but anyways, um, so, you know, and I was going to ask you, what do you think is coming, coming with the, the latest sequencing? So back then, one won out over the other, I think because of Simplicity. Uh, I don't, what, what's I don't think it's out? simplicity. I think it, in the end, it's it's reproducibility. You can have a very complex protocol as long as it works. And, and the uh, Maxim Gilbert one originally, because you had to have single strand of DNA for the dideoxy. Mm -hmm. Later, they figured out how you didn't need the single strand. Then, then the Maxim Gilbert was slightly lower quality. I would say in general, and just a slight difference in quality makes the mm -hmm. will will sweep through. Uh, and I think that's true for next-gen sequencing. It not only is 10 million times cheaper, which is really amazing, but it's much higher quality as well. I mean, you can really get... Uh, so do you think we've got now with Oxford Nanopore? With I think Oxford Nanopore has advantages of length. Well, I would say nanopore, both Nanopore methods uh, have, have longer reads. Oxford has a record now with half a million base pairs, but it's not not quite, not every read is that long. It's just every now and then you'll get a read that's that long. Mm -hmm. So that'll, that'll be a consideration. The fact that it's portable uh, and it could conceivably be something you wear in 24-7, that, that's a, a niche, right? And the, another type of sequencing that we're gonna see is uh, being able to read things in their three-dimensional context. So normally we just shred the, the cells and the three dimensions out, the, you lose that information but we're getting, seeing increasingly a trend of knowing where the DNA, RNA, and protein is in the, in the cell at super resolution. So you can think of that as like the ultimate in microscopy. So it's, it's, sequencing is far from uh, stopping its revolution. Um, and even though we've brought it down 10 million fold in price, I wouldn't be surprised if we brought it down at least another thousand fold. Um, uh, just a couple other things before we open to the audience. So you mentioned uh, J.K. Hay and the use CRISPR to uh, in human uh, embryos to edit the gene, uh, which is a receptor for HIV virus. Um, so that you know uh, generated a lot of uh, excitement, I guess, uh, in the medical community and elsewhere. So um, maybe controversial a bit. You talked about this a bit in your talk about which you know, genes can be repaired or replaced. So where do you see those kind of, you know, technologies going in the future? 
Right. So I, I mentioned a little bit in my talk that that uh, that figuring out what to do with germline is first of all, there's not that many things you can do with it. You can't do some other way. So if you this was done by in an in vitro fertilization clinic. In fact, the couple was in there because the, the husband had uh, HIV. And so typically you wash the sperm before you do that so that the child doesn't get HIV. But uh, the, the things that you can do with it can either be avoided by genetic counseling, as I mentioned, very, much less expensive, much less invasive, uh, much less risky to future generations. Um, some of it can be done with gene therapy after it's born. Uh, there, there's, there's some alternatives. Interestingly, he's criticized for picking something that, for which there were alternatives, which is HIV. It is true there are alternatives. There's safe sex, there, there are multiple drugs, uh, and there's the promise of vaccines that have been promised for decades now. Uh, doesn't alter the fact that a million people die every year from HIV. It's 2% of all deaths worldwide is HIV. So it, to say that it's a solved problem and you don't need any, uh, you don't need to look at new solutions is, I think, an overstatement. Uh, so I, you know, it needs to go through safety and efficacy testing, just like any other therapy. But it's not like just any other therapy. It, it needs more scrutiny, and it's certainly getting more scrutiny. Steve, you have a comment on that? Uh, well, you know, I, I, Janet's here. She may want to comment. But they're doing the experiment went, to, went against, not to say it's right or wrong in that person's eyes, but went against the international communities, uh, at least the stem cell communities, developmental biologists, who recommended a moratorium on germline editing. And um, so, um, so I think that's important. And, and, and in a way, it's to these things are put into place to study the technology, to understand things like specificity, because genome editing, by definition, is you're trying to edit a, a very specific site in the genome, which you can do, but you don't yet know what's happening elsewhere. It's pretty darn good by all indications, but probably needs some more time to know. Jeez, again, these off-target effects we talk about yeah, with drugs well, and everything else. Well, even what, how we define off-target right now may not be how we define off-target in a few right. years from now. Uh, so anyways, it, it's, it's like any new technology is moving so fast. But in, in, in the case when you start to do experiments on germline, which is considered sacred by many different societies, uh, I think you, you want to just really think about things. Yeah. Um, so, but you know, in, in many other conditions, uh, Editing is being used in rare, rare disease somatic, in a somatic way sense, and it's happening at Hospital for Sick Children and other places in the, in the sure. clinical research setting, clinical trials going on. Uh, so the technology will bring some solutions to um, to diseases that don't exist right now. Yeah, that's great. And that's why it's so so important to continue the research, but really to think about the ethics of the questions and the, the cells that you're modifying. So I just want to make two yep. comments yep. on that. One one is. The moratorium, there was already a moratorium on, on all therapies, not just gene therapies, not just germline, in that you can't practice medicine on, with a new drug until it's been through a process of approval. And so the moratorium was on top of that and in a certain sense redundant. Uh, and off target, there was already an approved, FDA approved clinical trial on CCR5 uh, uh, editing. Uh, different editor, uh, zinc finger around the CRISPR, but the same, the same outcome, which is you create alleles that have never been seen before in the human population, um, and you generate billions of them in the case of T cell therapy, which was what was approved, while in J.K. Ho's case, he could test the clonal derivatives to make sure that they were not off target, and he could test them again uh, after the pregnancy was established, which he did. And he did that hundreds of tests. Uh, yeah, but I I, would watch, I watched that presentation. I went and watched the videos, and yeah. I s stopped the videos and looked at all the slides. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that that really needed to go through scientific peer review. And yeah. I'd I'd love to see the data. I, I have seen I have seen two articles from his lab mm -hmm. that are going through peer review, but they're getting rejected because of the uh, concerns. And so the. The, you know, no editor wants to be responsible for publishing right, something right, that's right. going to get him yeah. fired <laughs> and so, or her fired. And, uh, it's true. and so we have a chicken and egg thing. I totally agree. We need, peer, we need this to be in the public, we need peer review instead of all these rumors. And you, 
and people like you having to look at the slides for, because the data, there's tons of data in these two papers. Uh, I think it's kind of, it's a tragedy uh, that this couldn't have been done some other way. Yeah. So we'll go back to Back to the Future. Yeah. So George Church goes ahead 30 years, as they did in the movie. What will you see? A woolly mammoth in a zoo? Not in a zoo, it's good. <laughs> Hopefully in, in a lot. So the woolly mammoth is a side project that we have. Most of what we do is on medical, uh, but there's, there are environmental issues. And the Asian elephant is an endangered species, and there's 17, 19 million square kilometers of endangered uh, tundra where the endangerment is, is carbon and methane and carbon dioxide could be released 1,400 gigatons, which is, to put in perspective, uh, nine gigatons is what the entire human consumption, uh, it, so 1,400 is a much that larger amount that could be lost uh, by mere melting or could be, some of it could be gained by sequestration. It's kind of a long story, but uh, elephants are, uh, and other herbivores are missing from the environment, and they would, they would change the ratio of grass to trees in a very favorable way for us. So I would hope not zoos, but spread through the 19 million square kilometers of the Arctic in Canada and uh, Alaska and uh, Russia. And, and it's, there's a park already in Russia that's dedicated to testing these ideas uh, in, uh, in Siberia. Uh, that's one thing, but I think there'll be many other things that will be mind-boggling uh, in the next 30 years. Uh, many of them will be medical and agricultural. Yeah. Well, I hope your interventions for aging pan out as well in that case. For yeah. sure. that, so we're going to open it up for questions, and Kirsten has a microphone. Just put your hand up, and she'll go around and pose either this to Stephen or to George. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you all so much for your time today. It was very stimulating to hear your conversation and Professor Church, your presentation. I'm curious if you could give us any kind of an update on uh, the Human Genome Project right, uh, both on the science as well as you alluded to in your presentation, what sorts of other factors are in consideration on a project like that, the ethics, the communication, the, the social factors or human factors. Right. So Human Genome Project, right, we, try, we tried to make the communication a, a top priority. We had 37% uh, of the presentations in our first meeting were on, uh, were ethics related. Um, Tell and people what it is. Uh, genome Project, right, is like genome, the Genome Project that everybody talks about is reading it, which started in 1984 and sort of hasn't quite finished yet, uh, and continues in Personal Genome Project and other uh, uh, sequencing the population, we want to be able to synthesize the human genome or at least do uh, modify it and not just make a copy of it because that we already have a copy of it. Uh, we want to make something new. Um, after a couple of years of discussion, we, we decided we should pick a, a, an example project that would illustrate the technical challenges, the ethical issues, and a, a practical social uh, outcome. And we chose making human and pig cells that were resistant to all viruses. Um, not, just, not just the ones we know about, but all of them by changing the genetic codes. So we've proven that this works in um, industrial microorganisms uh, um, where you can change the genetic code such that the, the host is fine, but the virus is completely flummoxed. It's like, what new genetic code? I can't handle this. And, and you can make it s the genetic code with a very a small number of changes, you can make it uh, so that the virus would have to make so many changes to its genome all in the right direction and none in the wrong direction that it would be, it's, it just can't handle it or even evolve around it. So that's, that's, the, that's the kind of the flagship uh, effort in the GP right is to make human cells, because human cells are used uh, for uh, production of protein pharmaceuticals, antibodies. Et cetera, and they get when they get contaminated with virus, it's a, it's a disaster. This happened at Genzyme. Most companies won't fess up to it, but this this uh, wiped out Genzyme both sides of the Atlantic for two years. Um, and also, human cells are used for cell therapies, and you would like them to be virus resistant. And then pigs, uh, I already illustrated how you might be using those for transplants. You'd like those also to be virus resistant. So that's that's what we're aiming for. It could be as, as few as 6,700 changes, could be as many as a million changes, 
spread out through your uh, six billion base pairs. Okay. Another question somewhere? Um, thank you for this uh, uh, fascinating glimpse into the work that you do. Uh, recently, there have been uh, a number of uh, reports about uh, the fact that uh, interaction among genes has proved to be much more complicated than initially thought. And uh, another complication that's now surfacing is uh, the influence of uh, um, epigenetics on the expression of genes. Um, you haven't said much about epigenetics. Um, are you working on that as well as on uh, the genes themselves? Yeah, I, I, um, I did mention it without <laughs> using the right, uh, without using that particular jargon. So the example of epigenetics is when, when I said there's addition, subtraction, precise editing, and regulation. Uh, regulation is epigenetics. And the illustration I gave is that we uh, can use combinations of, of uh, genes to turn stem cells from my, from my body into any cell. So I, it, for example, brain cells uh, and blood vessels. So that's epigenetics. And it's, it's also an illustration we're getting in control. I wouldn't claim that we're in complete control of any, any technology, but, we're, but epigenetics is no longer quite as mysterious as it used to be. In terms of gene interaction, which is related to epigenetics, I gave as an illustration the aging reversal where we went through 45 uh, genes that can interact in various ways through nine different pathways of aging, and we picked a subset that, with, that now handle uh, five different diseases of aging. So many of these things, they may seem daunting until you start doing experiments on them, and some of these experiments you can do on simple cells in culture, you can do like I said, you can, the same multiplexing with its advanced reading and writing DNA can also advance the study of epigenetics, developmental biology, and gene interactions because many of these things you can do in a very short period of time in the laboratory with millions or billions of cells in parallel. So what used to be something where you would dedicate your life to an experiment, you can now dedicate your afternoon to a billion experiments. <laughs> I think we have time for one or two questions. Can I just add one very quick Go comment ahead, there? Yeah, so, so that's the great questions. And there's all kinds of other molecular information. And, but just for the audience to emphasize um, how important it is now that we can finally have the genome sequence. Because to make sense of all this other data, you need to lay it onto the genome sequence. So George alluded to you know, why humans are different. Um, what we know is, is, is the, the, the number of different types or isoforms they're called, or uh, forms of a gene, they're much more complex than human. And you could only actually see that when you um, lay down the RNA sequences of genes onto the human genome. So it's the same with methylation or epigenetic data and all these new things we're finding about uh, long non-coding RNAs. So having the reference genome now in large numbers allows us to use math and try to figure out what this genetic variation plays into it. But it's the genome sequence, which is, I think, the major advance to lay all the other biological data against. Okay. And we're there now. Now we just need to get huge numbers. <laughs> yes. Uh, to one, uh, the question I have is, <laughs> what? Um, okay, I'll get right to it. Uh, what um, research? Um, what, uh, what? How is stem cell research? being used to fight against the, uh, and stem cell transplants being used to fight against the uh, AIDS virus and the HIV virus. Because I remember, I heard this morning that a man in Great Britain uh, who had stem, just had a stem cell plant transplant is now virtually uh, AIDS free. Well, one of the f first things that happened and one of the inspirations for the CCR5 is that someone who had uh, had both uh, AIDS uh, <coughs> and uh, a, a, a disease that required a, hemo a blood transplant was simultaneously cured of both diseases. And that was the first indication that you could, uh, with a, a CCR5 double null uh, T cell population, you could be resistant to HIV. So that's 
one of the first actual cures of HIV is by making somebody who is resistant to uh, the, the virus they're in, uh, infected with. Uh, while drugs are, are something that, where you have to take the drug for the rest of your life, you're not really, not really cured, you're just keeping it in, in, in check. Um, I'm not sure exactly what we're referring to, but it could be something like that. Uh, there, it, there are clinical trials that are approved for editing um, stem cell, uh, matter of what, the blood stem cells. Okay, so I think we had a great conversation. I'm going to turn it back to Bettina to uh, kind of wrap up, and thank you. Wonderful. Well, um, I think uh, I'm stunned, like I think a lot of you. I would just like to invite you, if you have more questions, uh, Dr. Church is, is going to be around for a little bit, and so is Dr. Reinhardt and Dr. Scherer. Um, I'd just like to say, you know, it reminded me that, uh, you know, the, when the Human Genome Project uh, got on its way in the U.S., the Canadian response to that was the creation of Genome Canada and the Genome Canada Enterprise and the genome centers of which uh, Ontario Genomics is a part and um, has leveraged about $3.6 billion for uh, research to contribute to um, uh, some of the things that you heard about today. So we're very proud of that. We're inspired, of course, uh, listening to uh, Dr. Church and everything he has started. Um, and uh, so we, we're left with lots of um, uh, things to think about. Um, I'm particularly interested in uh, the fact that now sequencing the genome is zero dollars and your book is still $25 on Amazon. <laughs> so uh, the choice is uh, getting harder and harder. Um, but uh, with that, I would just um, like to uh, recognize again um, our partners in the event today, um, the Royal Canadian Institute for Science, uh, Toronto Health, Gairdner, and us, Ontario Genomics. And please join me in thanking our wonderful panel today.